Hello, everyone. Uh, we are in our final moments before we start here at the top of the hour. Let us know if you have any issues. Type them in there. We'll check your comments. And hopefully you can hear me fine. I think we're there. Welcome, everyone, to the monthly webcast of the Stewardship Network, November 2019. If you tuned in hoping to hear the voice of Lisa Brush, our executive director, surprise, you get me instead. This is David Borneman. I am a longtime Stewardship Network board member, conference planner, uh, fan, and I'm filling in for Lisa, who is out in California, sunny California today, rather than here in Southeast Michigan, where we got a record breaking 11 inches of snow this week. And five degrees of the night. And five degrees overnight, record cold as well. With me today is Jacqueline Corteau, who is going to be uh, talking to us today about monitoring impacts of deer on vegetation in natural areas. We'll get to her presentation in just a moment. Let me orient you first to this table, to this uh, screen that you're at, if this is new to you. On the left side, you see an alphabetical listing of participants. We're up to 65 and climbing by the moment. Just below that, where it says chat, is a chance for you all to introduce yourselves, tell us where you're from. And also during the presentation, if you have um, questions or comments, feedback like we're breaking up a bit, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. Uh, type in your questions, type in your comments there. We will be monitoring those and hopefully getting questions answered. Let me just speak and ask once more if it's still breaking up. How, is this still, uh, are we still breaking up a little bit? It sounds like, thank you, Steve and Dave. Is it still breaking up? That's better, much better. All right, that's good. Keep us posted on that. Uh, all right, a few other technical things here that we are getting input in from, from Rob. Thanks to Rob from the Stewardship Network staff for handling all things technological. If anything else happens or needs to be done with that, let us know. Thank you, Julie. We will try to speak a little louder. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the Stewardship Network here, if I can get this slide to advance. Rob, my slide's not advancing. All right, hold on. Bear with us here, everyone. Uh, yes, go ahead and tell us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go ahead and tell us who you are, where you're from. Type it in there. Thank you, Steve. Breaking up here and, and there still. All right. And not very loud. Not very loud. We'll have to talk louder and slower and uh, see if we can avoid breaking up. The Stewardship Network has a mission to protect, equip, and mobilize people and organizations to care for land and water in their communities. We do these webcasts the second Wednesday of every month at 12 noon on Eastern Time. So tune in every month. If this is uh, the first time, welcome. If you are a returning person, welcome back and hope to see that you'll join us every month. The Stewardship Network, uh, we're capacity builders and provide backbone support for everybody out there across the country and the U.S. and uh, internationally who uh, works to preserve, restore, and manage natural lands and waters. We were established about 20 years ago and officially became a 501c3 about 15 years ago. National and international award-winning model of collaborative conservation one of the things that we do best is with our three C's, our collaborative, collaborative conservation communities. And uh, we handle inquiries from all around the world. We've been called the up and coming conservation organization with the right trajectory. Keep, uh, keep giving us feedback about the sound quality. See, we're just going to pause for just one moment. We're going to pause for one moment here while we try to get the sound working. Uh, we are back. Let me know if the sound is any better. Rob is trying to work some wonders for us here. While I continue talking about the Stewardship Network and all that we do as a backbone organization, we've got, um, let me just jump on through these so we can get on. Our collaborative conservation communities are locally defined geographically. 
We've got a bunch of these around the country and more coming online. Um, lots of interest. If you're interested in learning more about this, you can email the staff at stewardshipnetwork.org. The Stewardship Network benefits from partnership with thousands and thousands of different organizations and individuals. Uh, just a few of them listed here. Lots more on the website. All of you out there on the webcast land are a part of this as well. Besides our monthly webcasts, you can check out our event calendar, uh, the job board. These, these webcasts are archived, and you can look, find some wonderful ones that are on the website there as well. Lots of online resources. Save the date. Actually, go ahead and register for this now. The Jan our annual Stewardship Network Conference coming up January 17th and 18th in uh, East Lansing, Michigan. It's always a great time. We have around 400 people there. It's a great interdisciplinary gathering. We hope to see you all there. And finally, we are a 501c3 organization. We appreciate your financial support to keep things running smoothly here so that we can continue to offer these, these free webcasts. And with that, I am still reading your comments. Uh, we'll keep working on the volume. Hopefully, it will, it will be better and stop, stop breaking up. But I want to turn us over to my colleague and friend of many years, Dr. Jacqueline Corteau. I've known Jacqueline since our kids were in school together long, long Even ago. Even before kids. Even before kids, that's true. Your first year here. That's true. Um, and so we're going to turn it over to Jacqueline to talk to us about fed monitoring deer populations here in natural areas, both in Ann Arbor but throughout southeast Michigan. Type in your questions, I'll feed them to Jacqueline. And with that, Dr. Corteau, welcome. Thank you so much, Dave. Actually, I wanted to thank you especially because you may not remember this, but you gave me the motivation to start compiling this survey of monitoring methods back in 2015 when you asked me how the city parks should be monitoring for deer impact. So All right, you're welcome. This, this started with you. Um, I just wanted to, to say also that my focus today is going to be on how we are monitoring deer impacts more than really a, a presentation of specific results. I think an early version of this, um, the e-blast about this focused on the results rather than the monitoring. But just, just to give a plug, I'm going to be giving a big data talk on Friday for any of those of you who are local in Ann Arbor. Um, and that will be a time when I will be going over in detail three years of data from my studies in 15 different Ann Arbor natural areas. There's also information on the Ann Arbor Deer Management website for the Ann Arbor studies that I've done. And my own website, which is still under development, will have summaries and links to a range of other studies that I've done. But for now, the emphasis is on methods. And I also want to say I'm going to talk really fast because I'm condensing a three-hour workshop into one hour. So I'm going to try and acquaint you with a lot of things, and Dave will pause me if, uh, if there are questions that I can answer along the way. Yep. So just to give you an overview, what I'd like to start out with is just a brief review of literature that suggests how, quote unquote, overabundant deer affect vegetation. But I'm going to spend the bulk of my talk talking about how do we research and monitor deer impacts to assess local impacts, given that there are a lot of things known regionally? What can we say about our particular sites? And then why are those vegetation impacts important? And I want to step back a little bit and think about populations and species, and then also about community processes and trophic levels and interactions. Just a brief note on the focus. When I talk about monitoring deer impacts, I want to make sure to emphasize that we're not just talking about deer damage, but that monitoring for deer impacts allows us to take the pulse of things we care about, like tree growth and forest regeneration, our spring flora and summer wildflowers, and the resources they offer to pollinators. Things like biodiversity, how it's changing over time, and how invasive species are affecting it. So I want to emphasize that we can use the concern about deer impacts to understand and track ecosystems better. And then those of you who saw that I was also presenting on nature journaling and connecting to nature, um, I also have to give a plug for being out and monitoring deer impacts is a great opportunity to, to take care to wonder. So just, just making sure that we think about that as well. 
Briefly, many of you probably have heard of deer overabundance, a term that Dale McCullough um, introduced in 1997 with a special issue of the Wildlife Society Bulletin that year. Deer are a native but overabundant, or often characterized as over, overabundant herbivore. They're a generous, generalist browser that exerts many effects, not just browsing, but also non-consumptive effects like trampling and bedding down, um, nutrient addition. Their antler rubs can also be very damaging to trees. Many studies have found deer impacts on forests throughout Northeast America, and two of the volumes that I show here um, presented big compilations with a lot of research. Continuing over the past 20 years, more research has emerged. Waller, for instance, did a large analysis of forest inventory data showing declining tree regeneration across a broad swath of the uh, Great Lakes states. Many studies have shown decreased native forb diversity, abundance in flowering, declines of sensitive species, orchids among others, and increased proportions of invasive species and weedy species. Deer impacts can be pervasive and long lasting, and many researchers have come up with some very evocative ecological terms to characterize them. So for instance, people talk about the ghosts of herbivory past, a term that Waller has used, um, people characterize legacy effects where you can have the development of depauperate, uh, recalcitrant and browse tolerant understories. And in many parts of the Northeast, they're facing forests that have an understory of um, hay scented fern and no tree seedlings at all. People have used the term biotic homogenization to characterize the reduced diversity that we're seeing in our forests. Yeah, just the message I'm getting here is that uh, this is a pretty widespread issue. It's not just here in Southeast Michigan, but all around the country. Uh, Don Waller, who you referenced, was one of my professors in Wisconsin and throughout the Northeast. I know there's been lots of work as well. So we've got lots of deer, maybe an overabundance of deer throughout the country. Yes, and certainly east of the Mississippi, I think there has been more of this study, but but in places west of the Mississippi is. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well. And in Canada as well, as, as Steve points out. Yes, thank you, of course. In Ontario, we know, and uh, other parts of, of eastern Canada. Um, some other terms that people have used are things like alternative stable states. In ecology, we've often thought that there is this logical, orderly progression to a climax community, but if we're having a lot of um, trees browse, we might not get the same community and progression. Some people have introduced the term forest disintegration, that forests may actually no longer persist and we may get a conversion mm -hmm. to fern and sedge or grassland. Mm -hmm. And finally, finally, one researcher has suggested that what we are seeing in northeastern forests is a scentless spring where every, um, all of the spring ephemerals that might have given an aroma to our, our spring wildflower walks are simply disappeared. Sounds pretty dire. It, it can be, and in some sites we might see it. Um, I, so let me give you a little bit of, of the evidence of how you can study that in your site. So all of these studies have offered a lot of evidence in general, but deer impacts do vary considerably within and across sites, depending on land use history, landscape context, regional preferences, um, and the duration of high deer population. Management, however, relies on local and site-specific assessment, that is, on monitoring. Yeah, you know, my, uh, as a member of the staff of Ann Arbor, where we're dealing with deer issues, I can certainly attest to that. It's one thing to say deer are overbending in lots of parts of the U.S., but the question is always, okay, but what about here in our community? If we're talking about actually doing any control, we need to know what the impacts are here locally. So that's what you're going to tell us about today is how we monitor those local impacts. I am. And so I'm going to use as examples a range of studies that I've done looking at deer impacts in Michigan over the past 20 years. These are examples, and I'll use my examples to illustrate the different methods rather than to present you with a single narrative of a single location. So this map just shows you an overview of some of the areas that I've worked in. There are actually more points that I could add from more recently. So how can we assess deer impacts? I think there are about seven methods that are, are widely used in management or research or both. Uh, 
And I've arranged them in a continuum from the more observational or descriptive methods to the more experimental and or quantitative methods. And of course, there's integrating. You can do some of the, the methods that I've listed earlier in a more quantitative way. And some of the methods later can be very observational or descriptive. But just as a rough way of trying to think about how we're assessing impacts, I thought this continuum was helpful. So starting with photo monitoring, here is an example of looking at photos of how deer might have affected trillium populations. I'm showing, this is the uh, Nicholas Arboretum in Ann Arbor. These are the same views, the same font. They look at my tree that's marked there, that same yeah. crooked tree. Wow. Uh, it, it's a, maybe a slightly different angle, but I tried to get as close an angle as I could. So the first photo shows the site in May of 2008, and the second, when I came to that site in May of 2016. Dramatic declines in trillium are clear. Was it deer that did that? That's the question. So I want to emphasize that although photo monitoring can be quick and easy, uh, you really have to use it with other methods. It doesn't alone pr prove the deer impacts. Um, and I should say it can be quick and easy, but it requires good documentation and management. And I know, Dave, you've dealt with those challenges in your photo monitoring program for the city. Yes. For my own part, I find that using something like the Collector app and ArcGIS to hold those photos and keep them for analysis is really useful, but even that has its challenges. Moving right along, the next step in this continuum, continuum is, something, is doing species inventories or floristic quality assessment. And starting with just very simple observational data, it can be informal or it can be more systematic. But one example from this area is Kensington Metro Park, where naturalists kept spring phenology records starting in the 1970s. And by the 1990s, they noticed that 23 out of the 69 forest wildflowers that they had been tracking had disappeared altogether from the parks, from, from that park, including six of the 10 orchid species, and that 19 of 25 formerly abundant species were now rare. The problem is, of course, again, what caused that change? They, they thought that it was deer, but without more rigorous methods, it, it was hard to be sure. Um, we did do some site visits, and in all of those cases, we're able to rule out invasive species or successional changes in forest cover. And in one case, there was some hydrological change. But most of the others, it wasn't clear what other factor might have been responsible. But again, that, a snapshot in time doesn't really, doesn't really tell you the cause. Yeah. And I just want to make the point that Tony Resnicek has frequently made. Tony uh, runs the Michigan flora efforts here in Michigan. By the time people notice that deer are affecting vegetation, the most sensitive species are already gone. Yeah, so it may not be, uh, these may be subtle changes that, are, that happen slowly over time. It's not like walking out one day and realizing that they, maybe you walk out and see that they ate your hostas the night before, but some of these impacts in natural areas are stretched out over a long time. So it's a little bit about like that fox and, or fox frog in the pot of boiling right, exactly. water, right? You might not always notice it until it's pretty yeah. far advanced. I was just going to point out, you mentioned the term for FQA or floristic quality assessment. We're not going to explain that now, but if people have questions about what that is, uh, research that online, send us an email. There's lots of information out there about using floristic quality assessment systems to monitor the quality of natural areas. So again, I think the best use for species inventories is to supplement some of the other more experimental and quantitative methods, um, keeping in mind that record keeping is great. And without these naturalist records, we really wouldn't have insight into those sites. But at the same time, correlation, correlation does not equal causation. Um, so we have to make sure that we're doing other things to assess whether deer are responsible for those changes. And then in terms of using FQAs, keep in mind that they don't incorporate, don't traditionally incorporate abundance. So they don't actually show population reductions. You could have a decline from 1,000 trillion plants to 10, and the FQI, the Floristic <clears throat> Quality Index, would still be the same. 
There are some modifications, including the universal FQA calculator that allow you to include abundance, and I would highly recommend that if you're going to be tracking vegetation for deer impacts. Yeah, so FQ, the pollution quality index number won't change until that species is wiped out entirely. Right. Steve has asked a question, are these, do these um, suppressions of the wildflowers, is, these tend to be temporary things, or are they, is it a permanent thing? Once these populations are gone, of the trilliums and things, are they gone forever? Well, that's a good question, and I'll show a couple of slides that show a particular trillium study that will get at that. Um, Walt Carson and his group have shown that these legacy effects in, in Pennsylvania forests can persist decades or more. I think it really depends on the amount of time that deer impacts have been high and how long and how intensely plant spring flora like trilliums have been yeah. browsed. In my sites, in my most heavily um, impacted sites, recovery has been very slow when I protect trillium populations from further deer browse, but in sites that aren't as heavily affected, they rebound fairly quickly. Okay, good. So here's just an example about how you might use an FQI to look at deer impacts. We know from the intermediate disturbance hypothesis that you might actually predict that there are more species with deer, but if you're thinking about what kinds of species come in when you have more deer, they tend to be the more of the weedy and invasive species. And so in one study that I did, the FQI actually went down here in these graphs, the green are the native species, the orange is the inventive or non-native. And this particular study uh, was looking at, at interactions with autumn olive as well. But the, but the relevant comparison um, is to look at the, on the right-hand graph, the orange is the uh, with deer and the, and the Green is the without deer. And so in every case, the FQI is higher when you don't have deer presence. And let me just reassure people, uh, I know having seen your presentations before, some of these slides with a lot of data take a little time to look at and absorb. Uh, so if you're busy taking notes and things, rest assured that these this will be archived and you can go back and watch this and pause it and take notes on all these graphs. So uh, don't be discouraged if it goes by too fast today. And I also will give my email address if anybody has more detailed questions. I'm happy to continue the conversation. We'll do that at the end. So just going back to think more about assessing deer impacts. Um, so species inventories or floristic quality assessment is one way. Browse damage surveys are a way of really looking directly at deer damage. You can do those in a systematic way or you can focus on particular species. There are many ways of doing browse damage surveys. Some of these will connect with more forest ecology methods where you're doing forestry plots, but you can do plotless methods as well, quarter point or transect methods. You can look at all woody species, and I'm emphasizing woody species because it's easier and uh, more lingering to look at deer impacts on woody stems, um, but you can also do them on other species or you can select a subset of woody species. You can improve these by looking at what proportion of stems are browsed um, to look at browse intensity and their damage indices or uh, twig tallies that you can do. Do you, you want can, to define a spider transect in a so that, Yes, a spider transect is basically a method of coming to a large site and arranging your transects in a sort of spider pattern of eight different radiating spokes so that you can very quickly assess an area um, You'll do several hundred meters in each direction. That particular method was proposed by Heinz 2016, and it's in my uh, references. All right. Thinking about browse damage surveys, one of the questions that comes up, of course, is how do you distinguish deer browse from browse by other animals? In general, deer leave a shreddy edge when they clip woody twigs rather than a cleanly angled edge. Whereas rabbits and woodchucks, which have incisors, leave a cleanly angled 45 degree mark. It gets a little bit murky because squirrels and chipmunks may look a little bit shreddy like deer, but you'll see gnaw marks if you look with a hand lens and then bulls and mice leave lots of little tooth nibbles. Yeah, it seems pretty, pretty clear once you look at a few of these. Yes, and so here are a couple of photos to show. Um, on the on the left here, the deer browse is shreddy and on the right, the deer browse, or the rabbit browse is angled. And if you do photo monitoring in a systematic way, 
Um, here you can see that this particular stem, this is an, a red oak seedling, where it, what it looked like before browse and then how, and you can't quite see the shreds on that uh, image in the right, but I assure you they were there, um, how it looked after browse. And then just here are some ways that you can do systematic browse surveys. Uh, you can link them to GIS and do some analysis of, of how species differ or whether there are spatial differences in browse. And this example shows how the, the different dots are different species. The size of the dot is how much of it was browsed. Um, so that the bigger the dot, the more, the greater the percentage of branches on that individual. Herbivoclines? What's herbivoclines? So how does, you just like you have a thermocline yeah. um, how, or a geocline, how is herbivory changing over the landscape? Um, right. Things, I, I've done a number of analyses of the, this and I think I've never had the sample size to truly discern, but things like distance from a road or a trail or distance from water or distance into the interior or forest. There are definitely different places where deer are spending more of their time. Here's another example. This was a belt uh, transect uh, focusing only on oak species, recolonizing an old field and again the size of the dot indicates uh, how intense the browse was. The green ones had no browse and 81% uh, of the, these oak saplings were browsed and over half of them were had over half of the branches browsed, which means that, that that seedling might survive and persist, but it's very unlikely at that browse intensity to be able to become an overstory tree. So a few more details that, about browse surveys and the challenges. I'll just get on uh, to a couple more of these methods. Another one is tagging and tracking existing plants. Um, this is easiest with woody plants. When you work with plants like Trillium, it's hard to avoid damaging the plant when you label it and, and, and do the, repeated measures over time. Right, and that same kind of deer browse or rabbit browse we see on woody twigs, we're not going to see that on Trillium or other herbaceous things. Right, the real challenge with the herbaceous is that you have to get there fairly soon. I, I, Trillium stems will sometimes persist as much as a month, but often within a week or two of browse, they will wilt. Yeah. And so it's much harder to do herbaceous plants <clears throat> Um, and, and assess brows on them. You really have to have to come frequently. So if anybody wants to know more about the tacking and tracking AVID protocol, go out of that website? Yeah, so the AVID protocol is something put up by Cornell and the New York Department of Environmental uh, Conservation. Conservation. And they have a whole app and a program. It's really focused on New York, but it's a it's a system that they put together to guide citizen scientists through how to set up a, a plot and how to track both your woody species and your herbaceous species over time for deer impacts. Okay. One of the challenges that I've found when doing tag and track methods is that the tags and the tag plants both can disappear. Um, tags can be removed by animals, plants can die, it can be really hard to find the tags in the leaf litter mm -hmm. again. Um, so I think the tag and, track tag and track methods, while powerful, can be challenging and time consuming. The analysis can be complicated because if you have plants dropping out each year, the, um, it's complicated to do the statistics. Dave comments on something that uh, I think you've seen before where sometimes the deer themselves, if you tag the trees, the deer may find those tags. They yes. They preferentially browse on them. Absolutely. I've heard that a number of times from nursery owners who I've talked to that any kind of flags or tags deer can learn, when I ta which is why when I tag I only use a staple on the ground and which also means that my tag gets covered in leaf litter and is much harder for me to find, yeah. but at least I'm not signaling to the deer, hey, come and eat me. Yeah, so you find various creative ways to mark where the tree is without actually putting a tag on that on that tree, on that little seedling. Exactly. Another variation that people have used is to mark mature plants that have been damaged and have re-sprouts at the base. Um, trees in the northeast, like beech, uh, the, the chestnuts that still persist there, I haven't seen those in Michigan, uh, aspen, will re-sprout 
vigorously after damage, and so you can count the total number of, of stems and the total number that are browsed. When I've done that on a stem like uh, on a species like bladder nut, Staphylia trifolia, 95% of the respouts or more will be browsed. Or something like greenbrier can be a good indicator. Moving along, another technique is to mark plots and then track po populations rather than existing plants. Uh, sorry, individual plants. And so here you would have a circular or a square plot, and you would just count the number of plants, the number of flowering and seeding, and the number browsed. You can do that for focal species or for all the species. Uh, Rowinski's 10 tallest method is this kind of plot and population tracking method rather than an individual plant tag and track. You mentioned in that last slide about greenbrier. Are you saying that greenbrier is a good indicator plant to use? Uh, Rowinski has found it to be so, and I certainly find that Smilax hispida, which is in many of my sites, is, is heavily browsed. And so tagging a plant and tracking how many stems it has and how many are browsed can be useful. So why is it a good indicator? Because it's because of how do you browse on it or just because how it shows you the impacts over time? Uh, that it's just one that's common that you can often find and track. So the okay. challenge is always to find species that you, that occur across a range of sites for ready comparison. Okay. Here's an example of a permanent plot. This one is focused on trillium, also tallying the other spring flora species, including fall Solomon seal and true Solomon seal that are in here. But here's one of the challenges, as you pointed out earlier, Dave, of wow. monitoring herbaceous species. I don't, you can't see in the original photo, but I literally put a little piece of aluminum foil over every single trillium stem that was deer browse wow. there. It's very hard to see absence unless yeah. you are down on your hands and knees and looking for it. So if you came to this plot, you think, oh, there are plenty of trillium there. Right. But then when you actually see how many are gone, yeah, that's amazing. it's quite an impact. Yeah. And another technique that I've used a lot for assessing deer impact is exclosures. Uh, and many park systems have put these in place as demonstration plots. It's really important when you do exclosures to do an unfenced or control plot as well and to mark that from the outset. Exclosures come in all kinds of sizes and shapes. If you look in the literature, some people use one meter cubes for trilliums or other spring flora. That's what I do as well. So it's, a, it's covered on the top so deer can't browse in. Um, many times a 10 meter square size or 9 by 12, 10 by 10 um, is used for more forestry types of plots on woody plants. But there are, there are large forests that, that have uh, hectares or many hectares in their forest plots to really try and look at the larger community effects and, and effects on forest regeneration. Walt Carson and colleagues at University of Pennsylvania has done some large experiments using these large plots and looking at effects of fire and invasive species as well as deer. Important to keep a buffer along the fence line, both inside and out. Deer will push into those any kind of wire mesh fence and browse inside it as well. All right. A lot of different kinds of measures you can do when you're doing exclosure and control plots. Um, you can do full plot species inventories or FQIs. You can do focal species. You can do subsampling, all kinds of different measures. I'm just going to uh, go through a few samples here of the kinds of measurements that I've done in different park settings, uh, most of them forest, a few of them grassland. But here is an example of a park where they put in just a single exclosure and did not actually mark a, uh, any control plot. But you can see that after that exclosure had been in place for, I think this was about 17 years, there's a very dramatic difference in the number of trillium inside and outside. Again, though, it's a single exclosure, and they weren't tracking over time what was responsible for that. But given the amount of browsing on the fence edge, yeah. deer seem a likely culprit. OK. Uh, here are some subsamples I did in those exclosures where I looked at the number of stems, I looked at the number or the height of the tallest stems, 
or just did a cover index and in every single measurement that I did, um, plots protected from deer did better than the plots where the deer were present. But of course this was pseudo replication because these were subsamples within a single plot. That, does, I mean, that doesn't mean that it's not statistically significant, but it does mean it's not as generalizable as if you had better replication and baseline data that you could compare from the start. For the, yeah, continuing the kinds of measures you can do, I, there was more diversity and a higher floristic quality index. Another study, I, similar kinds of measurements, but another measurement that I added, which is very labor and time intensive, is biomass uh, sampling. And that's also a destructive sampling method, so you may or may not want to use it. And it was above ground rather than above and below ground, and there can be some complicated relationships. But just as, a, as an example, in this particular uh, setting, there was a much higher biomass in the tree seedlings and shrubs in the exposure plot than in either the control or a distant control. Quick question from Bob about your Kensington data. Are those published someplace? They are not published. Uh, but if they, if people email you, you might be able to get them. I touch. would be, yes. Okay. I'd be happy to share them. Okay. Here's an example of how you can use focal species and simply count. These were just looking at uh, the established single exclosure and then a near control that was as similar as possible that hadn't been established, but I established it after the exclosures had been in place a number of years. And then another thing that I've done is when there isn't replication, I also look at a more distant control plot because there can be just a lot of natural vegetation heterogeneity and looking at extra control plots allows you to assess where your fence plot falls into that. And in this particular example, it was very clear that trillium plants inside the, the exclosure were much denser and, and bigger than anywhere in any of the outside plots. Um, they were both taller uh, in the exclosure, and those taller plants were more likely to bloom or to slip that around. The smaller plants outside the the protection of the fences were much less likely to bloom. Yeah, I remember being impressed with that. It's not just a presence or absence thing. A lot of these impacts might affect how robust the plant is, how much it flowers, how uh, much it sets seed, um, all sorts of ways. It's a whole range of impacts it might have rather than just eating the whole thing. Right, and over time, of course, preventing plants from flowering and fruiting means that the population can decline. Right. Um, and there have been a number of studies with demographic models of trillium, including by Rooney and uh, by Tiffany Knight, where they have looked at browse levels of 5 to 15 percent. Anything beyond that on trillium is very likely to lead to local declines over time. Okay. Here's just an example from my Ann Arbor exclosures, and these actually are very well replicated. Where, um, if you're not familiar with Ann Arbor, these are just names of various parks around town. Yes, thank you. So each of these is five pairs, five plot pairs of one meter square fences focused on trillium populations. And the, the number of flowers or plants, or in some cases both, was, was the same at the start. So this is the difference that has emerged over time. You can see that where plants are unfenced and deer accessible to deer, the numbers have kind of jumped up and down. And that's partly because deer don't always browse as heavily. Uh, they don't necessarily come to every site every year. But in the deer, the plots protected from deer, there's been a steady increase in trillium over time. So getting back to that earlier question yeah. that Steve asked, um, you can have recovery over time. Yeah. And just how long will depend on how severe and what the species was. Right. Another thing that I like to do, though, even on an exposure study, is to actually try to assess browse damage where it's visible. This small understory shrub running strawberry bush, Euonymus obovatus, uh, clearly flowered and fruited more inside the exclosures, but then I could also look very carefully at the number of stems browsed, and you can see there is an inverse relationship there. The more they're browsed, the less likely they are to fruit or flower. And then another measure in exclosures can be your floristic quality index. Um, 
flowering of other species. This was a student and I worked on this project in the same trillium exclosures, looking at all the other species that were in those plots. And there were some really clear differences in floristic quality, or quality that emerged over that time, and also in flowering of all those other species naturally occurring in the plots. So exclosures are, are maybe one of the best ways to link deer presence to impacts on diverse plant species, and they can account for non-consumptive effects as well as browsing. But it's really important to collect baseline data, to do adequate replication, and to have an exclosure size that is adequate to capture natural variability within and between communities. I bet if people had other questions about exclosures, you could probably... Uh... Happy whole, to could have a whole presentation just on that. But, I absolutely could. Right. I, I cut out many slides on my exclosure right. presentation here. So happy to, happy to consider questions. It's important about to have that. a design that will actually keep the deer out. Um, yes, which is by, more challenging right. than it might seem. I at one point went through three different fence designs to effectively keep the deer out. Yeah. All right. So if you want more details on design for exclosures, that'll be something else to contact Jacqueline about. Yes. All right, what else we have? So just again, interpreting exclosure data, um, you know, one of the challenges is that if your sensitive species are already gone, if they're gone long enough, they may not recover. We did see trillium recovering, but there were some there. When I put those plots in place, some things may not come back. Um, th those, those impacts can be limit, uh, lingering. One challenge of exclosures that you, is that you actually can affect other animals. Small mammals, for instance, might actually discover that uh, there's more cover inside the mm -hmm. exclosure, and those local populations can potentially go up, and especially if you're also excluding other predators. So you might start to have some other interactions. Um, and it can be a costly and time-consuming method, sure. but really a clear one for showing deer impact. Finally, though, I wanted to get around to talking about experimental plantings, which in settings where deer have had long impacts may be the best method for having a standard to compare across sites. Other terms for this method are sentinel seedlings or bioassays, or some people have called them phytometers, using your plants as a meter of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is to plant and track experimental plants of one or more species to provide a standardized gauge within and across sites, regardless of what that initial vegetation was. Yeah, and the, the big benefit here is rather than trying to find, go out in the landscape and find uh, con enough populations of trillium or something, you can add exactly the right number of same species and have more control over all that. Right, absolutely. Because when I set up those trillium plots, I really wanted to also look at other spring flora, but I could not find any plots where trillium and other spring flora species co-occurred in large enough numbers across enough plots for me to do any kind of real comparison. So for instance, one or two plots had Solomon seal or, or full Solomon seal, but none had enough. Hmm. So one of the methods here, the sentinel seedling method promoted by Cornell, by Bern Blossom and his group at Cornell, uses red oak seedlings as a metric for assessing deer browse. And this is one that I've used in Ann Arbor to track deer impacts over time. And as I've heard you say, red oak are not their favorite food. It's kind of an intermediate food source. So we're not looking to see how it's not candy for them. It's something that they'll eat, but it may not be their favorite. Right, so it's often referred to as palatable, but the white oak group rather than red oak group tends to have lower tannins, and so that one is often preferred. But red and black oaks are bitter. Um, they're nutritious, but not as tasty, and so they're not the first thing that deer will browse in a site. Here's just an example of how this can be powerful because I can plant these seedlings into 15 different sites and look at that browse over time. And that's been really useful. Um, the red line here I should point out is indicates the level of 15%. And Blossy has suggested that browse levels of anything more than 15%, if you look at the long life history of oaks before they can start reproducing, um, that level is likely to lead to declines uh, in tree regeneration. And just so that, uh, go back to that slide. So that's 
Uh, this, I've seen this slide a lot. This is of our parks in Ann Arbor. So that's pretty telling. Anything above that red line, above 15%, suggests that those are forests that are not going to regenerate over time because of too much browse. And every one of those sites in Ann Arbor, it shows levels of browse far in excess of that. So right. a pretty telling slide in my, in my mind. Continued high deer impacts. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, we know that deer are not the only thing affecting our tree seedlings and small mammals, including uh, rabbits as well as squirrels and chipmunks, can have quite an impact in some years more than others. But this graph shows you um, the red is deer only, the orange is deer and small mammals both. So sometimes they tag team yeah. and one will browse, then the other will browse <laughs> very Often uh, a rabbit might browse and then the tree will re-sprout vigorously because oaks have that wonderful taproot, but then that new re-sprout is really tasty to the deer and then they'll come through and browse. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, we talk a lot about deer impacts, but um, whatever is browsing those small, those plants, um, whether it be deer or other small mammals, that can have the same kind of negative impacts over time. It can, and so if you really, if your primary interest is getting trees established, it's clear that in some of these parks, given the high small mammal damage, you might also need to think about protecting uh, trees from small mammals. But in many of the parks, deer alone or deer in combination with small mammals are exerting more impacts than the small mammals alone. Yeah. So which monitoring method is best? Yeah, that's the question. It is the question. Well, of course, it depends on your purposes, your site and context. Blossie and Waller and I are in the process of preparing a cross-method and cross-site uh, comparison, doing both a literature review and a data uh, compilation using several of the different methods that I've described here. So mm -hmm. be on the lookout for that. Cool. But I want to move on to think about why these vegetation impacts are important. And so to do that, I want to go back and think of some of our Ecology 101 with populations and species, as well as some of those community processes and trophic level interactions. All of you remember from your basic ecology the levels of organization that we talk about, individuals, populations, species, communities, and ecosystems. Communities are where a lot of the interactions happen between species. So things like competition for water, nutrients, and light. Predation, which is the extreme case of herbivory, where you actually kill the plant. Uh, deer will sometimes uproot them all together, or they might eat the seeds, killing the future plant. Um, or herbivory, where it's lesser levels <coughs> of damage. I think that's a really important point. I know one of the comments we've sometimes gotten from people in Ann Arbor, no matter what species you choose to focus on, if, it red, if it's red oaks or trillium, People will sometimes interpret that to mean, okay, so we don't have any red oaks seedlings, but is that really a big deal? Uh, no matter which species you pick, the, the issue is not the impacts to that individual species. You're still just trying to monitor the overall impact to the deer that the deer are having on the forest. So I think looking at these broader impacts, recognizing that no matter what species you, you check it's, uh, or you monitor, it's just trying to give you an overall an idea of the overall impact. But there's a much broader impact. For them. Exactly. Yes. Really trying to, and, and the reason that we choose individual species is that's the easiest thing to monitor. It's much mon harder to really get at these other interactions, but I'll try to suggest some ways in which these different techniques might do that, and some ways in which we're still struggling, like some of the ecosystem impacts, the, the impacts of adding all those, all that nitrogen, um, hard to say. But just to think now about, so how are these different monitoring methods giving us information about the different ecological levels? Some of them really do focus on individuals or populations, um, but others such as, as browse surveys or exclosures. I see I forgot to include exclosures here. Exclosures are one of the places that you really can get at those community level interactions. Yeah. And that's one reason why exposure <laughs> studies are so important. Cool. Another thing I wanted to, to talk about is, is there are direct effects as well as, well as indirect effects, that is, those mediated by other species or the environment. 
So it's really easy for us to think about deer impacts being just that direct damage, the consumptive effects, you know, the browsing that reduces the growth or dam or flowering or may just kill the plant altogether. Um, I've seen antler rubs that kill finbark shrubs. Um, trampling can break off stems. Some of the oak seedlings that I monitor in the city parks are just broken off by trampling. Yeah, with the antler rubs, I've seen, we see a lot of browse and it seems like being browsed once or twice, most of the plants can recover. But I've seen, you know, many trees killed by this one antler rub by uh, yes. a vicious buck or an aggressive buck. About 70% of that witch hazel shrubs in my backwoods are have been killed by antler rubs. Oh. And I was just watching an eight-point buck out my window this morning. So, But I think it's also important to remember that there are all these other associated effects, the non-consumptive and indirect effects, things like soil compaction, which, which is a microsite disturbance. It can open uh, places for weedy plants to seed in. The reduced cover from both browsing and trampling can affect the microclimate. So you can have an increased soil temperature and decreased moisture, and then that can further amplify the stress on plants that have been browsed. So I'm certainly seeing places where mortality is higher, uh, where, where the plots are not protected by fencing, not simply because of browsing, but also these other effects. Hmm. Um, things like seed dispersal, nutrient alteration, and so on. And then finally, differential browsing or differential tolerance by the plants of browsing can, can alter the competition. We talk about competitive hierarchies. So if, if native plants are being browsed more heavily, that might give non-native plants an edge indirectly. And here's a, a graphic from the US Forest Service to try and talk about some of those indirect effects, which we might talk about first order, second order, and third order effects, depending on how many intermediate actors there are in that process. There can be small mammals, invasive species, fire suppression, invasive earthworms in many of our northern forests. Deer impacts depend on the interactions, but they also might be a driver. So just as a, a final example, I want to talk about an ecological process of forest regeneration. Well, what are the components of that? Um, we have pollination. If we're thinking about oaks, pollination is by wind. So we don't have to worry about all the pollinators that might be um, in trouble in the systems, all the insect pollinators. Um, but they have to set seed, uh, and they're often affected by weevils that eat the seeds. Then those seeds are dispersed. The seeds might be eaten by all kinds of wildlife in our forest. There's the germination process. Um, and then once those seedlings germinate and start to establish, then there's competition for water, nutrients, and light. And that's when herbivory might happen. So I just wanted to, to point out how deer actually affect every part of that process. I've come to think of them as the apex predator in oak regeneration. Hmm. Um, on the one hand, a lot of acorns are damaged by weevils before they're even dropped to the ground, especially in areas where fire has been suppressed. So, so deer obviously aren't responsible for that. But they do, in fact, eat a good number of acorns. And then of acorns that fall, uh, and, and I did an experiment where I protected the acorns from any seed predators, and there was significantly lower germination where deer were present. And I can't hmm. tell you exactly the mechanism, wow. but I think it's those microsite or those um, non-consumptive effects where it might be there's less cover, less moisture, hotter temperatures are leading to the lower germination. And then many, many seedlings are damaged by both small mammals when they're smaller, but also deer can browse down to five centimeters. Um, and then of those seedlings that finally get past the small mammals, Maybe to that half meter size, that's where if deer browse hits them there, you yeah. know, the, the funnel is already narrowed and deer are wiping out that, that seedling, yeah. sapling and, transition. I just have to throw in that, you know, besides whatever impacts deer are having, um, oak forests are in trouble all around the country. Even in areas where deer numbers are not high, uh, the whole issue of maintaining our oak forests um, is a big issue. We talk about that in the fire community as well and over shading in some of those areas. So. Hard for these oaks forests. That's a, the future looks kind of scary for them. 
It does, and we all love the fact that the oaks provide so much cover uh, and food for our wildlife. Yeah. I'm going to skip forward just again. Why does the browse matter? Uh, we've talked about reduced seedling growth and survival, forest regeneration, and so on. But I just want to, a couple of other points that have come up um, is that that loss of forest structure affects many species and it can reduce ecosystem services to people, especially in our urban settings, things like water quality, flood and erosion control. Carbon sequestration is getting a lot of focus now. Um, it's still an open question whether older forests or younger forests take up more carbon, but certainly intact forests are, are better than highly disturbed sites. Um, just finishing up, a couple more points that deer are really considered now that keystone herbivore um, that affects many other species that can lead to trophic cascades, reduce resources for pollinators, and so on. Um, Deer are one of many stressors, and things like habitat fragmentation, invasions, and global change can all be important. So a lot of pe times people will say, well, but what about habitat fragmentation? Of course that's important, um, but deer amplify the impact. If species die off or fail to reproduce because of deer browsing, there just may not be seed sources nearby. What about invasive species? Deer actually can promote invasive species. Um, in various ways. And then climate change. Again, um, many stressors and are act to amplify the harms, but if you have a lot of climate stress and then you have deer browse in addition, then that can, the stress can be even greater. And then longer term, if you have deer caused reductions in tree regeneration, you can have a, a less potential for natural selection and natural migration. So just want to say I'm happy to entertain any questions. Keep that, uh, keep that email address up there. OK. Um, Beth, if you have more questions for Jacqueline, that's where you should contact her. Uh, I want to put in a, a, uh, my own comment to you and say really appreciate all the work that you've done in Ann Arbor. Um, when we started looking more seriously at deer population years ago, um, the question was whether we should just take on deer monitoring ourselves. Um, it was clear to me at the time and it's become only clearer that it's been very beneficial to hire someone um, who has expertise in this. You, the level of detail that you've gone to in um, monitoring our deer populations and collecting data has convinced me that we never could have done this on our own. So if you're thinking about monitoring this, you've got a lot of good ideas. If you're thinking about monitoring deer populations, I'm sure Jacqueline would be happy to, to guide you, but give it some thought before you jump into it and consider hiring somebody with some expertise to help uh, help you set up these studies and collect the right data over the long term. Well, thank you, Dave. I think we got most of these questions answered. Um, uh, Jenny wants to know if we can go back to the invasive species slide. And also, while you're doing that, Steve Young's wondering about what's the largest exclosure that you know about? What's the largest one? I saw one in uh, Illinois. And, um, Fermi Lab, they've got one that's maybe a couple acres. Out in the prairie out there? Right, I think Carson's exclosures in the Allegheny Forest are are many hectares, but I can't tell you exactly many how hectares. many. Oh. Yes, I've seen some in Pennsylvania state forests that are uh, maybe five yeah. hectares. Well, and some of the ones um, like the George Reserve, which here north of Ann Arbor, very high fence. Two, now the question is two always, square miles. Yeah, two square miles. How high is that fence around there? It's 10 to 12 feet, but poachers routinely do cut holes in that fence, yeah. and so there's been, uh, genetic studies have shown that there is genetic intergression, so clearly right. deer are getting in yeah. and out. Bill Cook suggests the River Road exclosure in Menominee County at 11 acres. Um, then the other question is how small the exclosure is, and um, I, my sense is that the bigger the exclosure, the, uh, the bigger and sturdier your fence needs to be. The smaller it is, you don't need to have as, as big of a fence. You could have one that's uh, five feet by five feet, and you don't need the fence to be as tall because the deer aren't going to jump inside of that. Uh, they they will jump inside <laughs> even a five foot. But so those those trillium exclosures that I showed data from are one meter by one meter, so a little over three feet. Yeah. But I put a lid on them. 
They're okay. three, they're four feet tall, and then I cover the top so that deer can't yeah. get in. There's lots of uh, lots of fine points I'm sure you could share about exclosures and what material you use and what size and designs. Um, as a guy that does a lot of prescribed burning, I always say if you want to, if you're going to build those, if you can do them out of metal and, and metal posts rather than wood, then it's easier to burn through those. So you can, you don't need to exclude fire from the area. Right, so all there. my city exclosures, I've done that. I previously did wood and vinyl mesh. There's a Deer Buster is an inexpensive vinyl mesh that, that also doesn't uh, interfere with visual sight lines. It's been used in the places like the National Zoo. Um, yeah, we, let's go on to the last slides there. Um, just going to get you that. And do one more. And I think, does it come back to me? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. I see all your acknowledgments there. Many, many, many people uh, to thank for all of this research over the years. Um, I have a whole bunch of references, and I also want to say that there is a local website, wc4ev.org, that has compiled a huge amount of literature on um, deer impacts, and you can often find good references there, and then some photo credits, but I'll just keep my email up in case anybody <laughs> wants to email. All right. Okay. Yeah, your email is in the chat as well. Um, Just I, note that this this deer was actually following me as I laid out my transect and was monitoring in the woods there. Um, I, I, I finished that transect, I went to the next, I looked up five minutes later and there she was. <laughs> Tracking you. Yeah. One of the next, um, so I also want to make sure we say that uh, you're talking a lot about impacts, that, you know, monitoring the impacts of deer. What you do with that information, um, I guess, is more of a local decision. It could be that Fencing is the answer to uh, keep deer away. It could be that you need to look at something else like sterilization or culling, but that's all um, a matter of, in, of individual choice and um, often requires, this is often good background data to support whatever decision you decide you need to make in those areas. Right. I'm really focused on providing the best information I can. Yeah. So with that, uh, I need to wrap up here. Our top of the hour is up, is has come. Jacqueline, thank you so much for sharing all your expertise with us. Uh, really interesting uh, last hour, and I know there's lots of other data out there that people could, uh, or other questions people might have that they can contact you about. As we close, I will remind everybody to uh, come to East Lansing, Michigan, uh, January 17th and 18th, and join us for the annual conference. We hope to see you there. It's always a good time. You'll Probably Jacqueline will be there. She and I are part of the conference planning committee. Should be a great conference coming up again this year. Uh, as always, thank you for your financial support of our 501c3 organization. And come back next month, December 11th, the second Wednesday of the month at noon Eastern time for our next webcast. And with that, I believe we're all done. Uh, we might stick around here for a minute after we turn off.